The first few moments of our sermon will be a voice of someone in our congregation, 40 years or younger. Um, and we're going to hear a little bit about that, and I don't know what um, these voices are going to say. There's nothing pre-scripted. I did not tell them to say anything or cover any topics. They're going to share from their heart what they think the future of the church is. Then I have some reflections on, on what I think they might say, and I might be completely off base, which is part of the reason we're doing this. So, without further ado, we're going to hear uh, the first emerging voice of the church. Actually, he's very much a part of the church already, as all these folks are. But let's hear from our beloved brother in Christ, Richard Hitt Pinkelman. Uh, Pastor. All right. Pastor Allen asked me to share my perspective on what is the future of the church, and since I'm not an authority on church matters, and I don't, in an effort not to give my own personal opinion on things, I thought that I would share what the Bible has to say about the future of the church. The Bible, which is our source of instruction for the church, and that is the guidance for those who seek to live a life shaped by the examples and teaching of Christ, and that's who I am and what I seek and how I seek to live my life, so I thought I would share um, what I found in the scripture about that. Here we find the future of the church clearly spelled out, but the question that remains will be, will we decide to say yes and then to walk into the future that Christ has planned for us? In Mark chapter 12, verses 29 through 31, Jesus tells us the great commandment is this, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second and most important commandment is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment more important than these two. So what is the future of the church? Our future is to love God and to love our neighbor. In Matthew 28, verse 19, Jesus tells us, Go to all people everywhere and make them my disciples. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey everything I have commanded you, and I will be with you to the end of the age. So what is the future of the church? Our future is to go and share with others the good news of life in Christ. So what is our message of good news? It is a simple and life-changing message. Let us as a church not complicate it. And that message is found in John 3, 16 and 17. For God so loved the world so much that he gave his only son, so that everyone who believes in him may not die, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to be its judge, but to be its savior. And in Romans 8, 35 through 39, who then can separate us from the love of Christ? Can trouble do it, or hardship, or persecution, or hunger, or poverty, or danger, or death? No, in all these things we have complete victory through him who loves us. For I am certain that nothing can separate us from his love, neither death nor life, neither angels, nor heavenly rulers or powers, neither the present nor the future, neither the world above nor the world below. There is nothing in all creation that will ever be able to separate us from the love of God, which is ours through Christ Jesus our Lord. Church, this is our future. May we say yes and walk into this future that Christ has planned for us. Amen. Okay, let's see how this works. Go ahead. I think we're going to do this a little more casually than I anticipated. So, okay, Richard told me a little bit uh, when we were preparing for this week what he might say. Uh, and I know Richard well enough to know um, how you were. And the first thing that I'm struck by Richard Hinkleman, who did not grow up in the Christian Church Disciples of Christ, that it, he is more Disciples of Christ than I am sometimes. <laughs> because I complicate the Gospel of Jesus Christ a lot. Because I need to think about it, I need to mull it over, I need to... Uh, I, I make it a little bit more complex. I love 
his willingness to go right back to the words of Jesus and to Scripture. And if there's anything that is part of our tradition, uh, it was to go back to the Bible. There's several of the mottos of the Restoration Movement that uh, we still ascribe to uh, fit exactly what you say. One of the mottos that was going around, some of you know this, no creed but Christ, no book but the Bible, no law but love. Uh, and the other uh, one that was going around that I think you remind me of, and that is, in essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. But in all things, charity. Hmm. So really calling us back to those kind of central scriptural themes is really to call disciples back to our own rootage, our own heritage. Uh, they, uh, the early uh, founders felt that we were complicating things by adding creeds and tests of fellowship and catechisms and, and a lot of that other stuff that, that while it might be important from an educational standpoint, people began to confuse the teachings with the Bible. So would you say that I'm kind of getting at what you're looking at is yeah. getting back to the basics? Yeah, getting back to the basics and not worrying about how do we do it, what's our method, you know getting back to the basics of this is our mission. This is what we're called to do. And I really, you could have picked all kinds of scriptures because scripture, the, the text is full of wonderful things for us to go and do. But I, I was really taken reading through those and then listening to the ones you said today. Other than the reference to the Trinity and the Great Commission, I don't think any of those scriptures you, you use are foundations for creeds or were part of the great debates of the church. You know, the great councils, the Council of Nicaea, the Council of Chalcedon, and those, while they were very, very important, and, and a lot of good things happened, they did kind of uh, uh, solidify uh, a theology uh, that sometimes gets in the way of, of the actual scripture. I really appreciate the love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul. I don't remember any big arguments in church history over that one. You know, nothing will separate us from the love of God, neither the height nor depth. Or, I don't remember a lot of church fights over that. Yeah. Well, that's that's where I see we've forgotten that verse. Right. And then the church fights have so. Right. Because our our creeds and our doctrines have overshadowed that verse. Right. And, and, you know, I want to be very sensitive here because there's some folks from traditions where they find that very meaningful and there's a great depth of spirituality in those. But usually those are people who are able to see the scripture through those as opposed to getting stuck on those, those creeds or those catechisms and not being able to see the scripture behind. So that's one thing I want to celebrate. You're as much, if not more, disciple than many of us and you're calling us to our roots. The second thing um, actually comes out of the fact that a couple of weeks ago I spoke at... Um, Chautauqua, thank you, Robert. Uh, and the theme of the week was the next greatest generation, talking about young adults like yourself and how you see the world. And one of the sub-themes was technology. So the communion meditation I gave at the disciples' house that Sunday, my, the, the title of it was, The Resurrection Will Be Tweeted. Kind of taking, taking off of a, another historic phrase about uh, the, the revolution will be uh, televised, but the resurrection will be tweeted. And the point I was making is that sometimes we get too caught up on the medium or mode of how we communicate and we forget that the, the message is the most important. There was a time in church history when the printing press, which gave the word of God to the people, was extremely controversial to the point that people would that, 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 that ministers like myself didn't want the people to have it because up to that point you had to come to me to know how to not just read and interpret scripture but to hear it um, so but we don't get the printing press mixed up with love the Lord your God with all of your heart soul, strength, and mind. In the same way, in the uh, mid-1800s, uh, the Methodist Church, when it came to America, learned that they couldn't have ministers in every single church, so they came up with a circuit body of ministry. And it's become kind of famous how each week the, the minister would go from church to church to church, and that was controversial in its day. But again, a circuit-riding preacher is, is, is 
is, is the means or mode of communicating the message. It's not the message itself. They still were proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ everywhere they went. So the extension I make is, that I hear from you is, today, we need to not get mixed up and worried about the mode of communication. Because someone next to you is tweeting that they found the prayer today to be particularly meaningful, which was a tweet I got just a little while ago, um, should not make us anxious and worried. Um, but rather, we should celebrate the fact that... Oh, why are we doing this? Okay. We should celebrate the fact that the gospel... Let's just turn this off. I'll just turn that one off completely. The gospel is being shared. Um, the fact that someone else learned something from Facebook and you had to wait till Sunday to hear the same announcement, we need to breathe deep. And remember, <laughs> it's about hearing the good news of the gospel. Neither uh, Nothing shall separate us from the love of God. So would, would that be a fair extension to say that what I hear from you is if the message is so important, we shouldn't get caught up on how it gets to people, but just get it. Uh, yes, and I think uh, different people hear the message different ways and are receptive to it. So if you receive something that I say verbally to you, and that's the, the most thing, that's the thing that resonates with you the best, then that needs to be a way that we're communicating the message of the good news. If someone else, you know, is surrounded by technology and that's how they hear the good news, then we need, that's how we need the good news to them. The purpose is for us to get the good news to them and not get caught. So then the last thing that, uh, and this actually came from reading through the Great Commission, uh, which you said was going to be one of our scriptures. And I'm very, very taken by the fact that that begins with, go, be there for. Um, and I'm enough of a church person of my age and my generation to, to know that I am completely infatuated with church buildings. Um, I love church buildings. We worked hard to make this building more beautiful, safer. Uh, we've worked hard, Cody Wright, to make the neighborhood feel good about our building, too. Um, but in the end, again, it's not the building, it's the message. Uh, and um, I know you've challenged us and me before on this, and that is go, get out there. That there are people out there who will never cross the threshold of, of this church uh, that still need to hear that message, that, that redeeming message. That uh, God so loved the world. God didn't just love the world inside the four walls of the church. God loved the world, but we need to get out there. And it's really, really hard for us when we spend a lot of time and energy and effort doing great programs like the food program downstairs. You know, never, never would I want to say that that's a bad thing because it's in these walls. But it just can't be the only thing. And, and part of that, I think, is empowering members of the congregation to know that when you leave this place, you are an ambassador of Christ. Whether in your apartment building, or at your work, or in your volunteer position, or just walking down the street, um, or, oh, well, aren't you coming? Um, see, he earns his So we need to be empowering one another to be those ambassadors for Christ, but also we need to be thinking at every point we can, when could this program of the church, when could this activity of the church that shares the good news of the gospel be done just as well in a coffee shop, um, in, in Novak Park, uh, down the street by Carnegie Library, uh, in your home where you invite your neighbors. Uh, so I heard that go really powerfully uh, in one of the scriptures that you gave. Good? Yeah. Go. Okay, go, go, go. Good enough. Thank you. This is the first of now six conversations. I hope that you will come and hear the, the good things that um, our, our new emerging voices have to say. And hopefully we'll all catch a little bit of the glimpse of the future of the church. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen.